Graham and I would also like to take you on a journey um, over the next 20, 25 minutes, um, and that's to consider with us how the shift to open content impacts not only our institutions, um, the wider research community, and our services to researchers, but also how it impacts our internal library processes, workflows, and systems. This kind of crystallized as, a, as an, an issue of concern for me last year as part of um, a GIST Collections coordinated workshop on the open access monograph book supply chain. Um, and we're going to use this um, as a case study to demonstrate that actually a wider cultural change is required during, within libraries to shift open content from being seen as an add-on um, and into the mainstream of our services, so the norm rather than the exception. So libraries have played and continue to play, of course, an important role within our institutions um, in terms of support and advocacy for open access. That can be through supporting institutional repositories, green open access, um, the, the payment of, of APCs, um, the development of research data management services in partnership with other units across the university. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing universities take a leadership, um, sorry, libraries take a leadership role within their universities um, in terms of open science. And a recent example of this would be um, the success of the Office of Scholarly Communications within the University of Cambridge um, in influencing and making sure that, ensuring that um, the, the university published a position statement on um, open research. Other forms of leadership can be um, involvement with library-led or, um, or library-supported university presses, and also providing um, opportunities for, for researchers to engage with citizen science initiatives. So that's at the institutional level and the, the work that libraries are doing there. We're also um, pushing for change more widely than our institutions, so affecting change within the wider research community and quoting the RLUK's current strategic plan to create a new environment for the transformation of research. This can be through engaging with funder open access policies, supporting GIST collections to bring about change in the open access marketplace, um, initially through transitional um, open access agreements, but moving increasingly towards transformative agreements, and also through um, initiatives such as UKSCL, and collaboratively working to, um, to develop and support infrastructure for open access. So how successful have our efforts been? Well, I'm not claiming that all the success um, in these areas is down to libraries, but certainly significant progress has been made in terms of influencing culture within our institutions and within the wider research communities. However, how different are we as libraries? Have we shifted our own in internal culture to embrace open content? We'd argue that there's still a significant amount of work to be done in this area, and the open is still seen as, seen as an add-on to our existing services, rather than being fully integrated within our work. So, for example, open activity within libraries tends still to be concentrated within one or two teams, and those teams tend to be very externally focused. And we've had discussions within our RLUK, um, in, within the Associate Directors Network, about the challenges that this provides us, um, both at a, a strategic level and an operational level, in terms of integrating um, open into our agenda. Over the past 20 years or so, libraries have transformed themselves from a, from a print, single copy, um, just in case world um, into one where we're able to deliver um, di digital, just in time, flexible business models. But this hasn't, hasn't been a pain free process and has taken significant internal changes in terms of systems, processes, um, and roles. But these processes, systems, roles that we've developed are still very much centered on a world where all our content is either purchased, or the majority of our content, content is either purchased or 
licensed through aggregator suppliers and publishers. We know that open content is only going to increase. The significant pressure from publishers, um, from funders, sorry, <laughs> not, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> start again. The significant pressure from funders um, with Plan S um, and um, the UKRI open access review coming out later this year. Um, and we already know that monographs will be included within the remit of the um, REF open access policy next time round. And increasingly we're seeing pressure from institutions themselves who want to make sure that their outputs are more openly available. So for example, just earlier this week we saw um, the recommendations from um, MIT's task force on open access, which as well as dealing with things like open monographs and code, made recommendations to support open textbooks and courseware. The number of open access books available within the Directory of Open Access Books is increasing um, at a, an accelerating rate. And the annual Simba report on the open access book market in 2016 was predicting an annual market growth of 30%. So this content isn't going to go away. It's going to become increasingly important for us. Um, and I'd ask, are we as libraries ready to manage this content? So this is the, the case study. Um, bit of this, and, and I, uh, I want to try and put it in, um, in, a, in a bit of perspective as well, especially considering some of the, um, the presentations we've already had at, at this conference. Um, now in this we're talking specifically about um, OA monographs in the library supply chain. Um, that doesn't mean we don't think or don't completely agree with Torsten's 2030 um, thoughts that everything will be OA anyway, although he did say that monographs may take longer, and that, that is also what Plan S says and a lot of people say. Um, what we're thinking is this is where we are at the moment, and this is where the, the, the cultural change bit comes in for, uh, for libraries. Um, so to put it into, into some context, to a certain extent, this goes back to, um, to 2016, um, and the very last thing I did before I left the library sector and the very first thing I did when I joined GIST Collections, which was both research and then have to write the report I'd just researched, um, around changing publishing ecologies, which was around uh, library-led presses and academic-led presses in, in the UK. Um, we know from, from that report, from the, uh, the surveys we got back from libraries and from the interviews we did with academic-led presses, um, that we've got a growing number of, of those type of presses uh, in the UK. Um, it doesn't, we're not just talking about those presses, though. We're, we're really talking about all of the, the, the open access monograph producers, um, of which there are, are now very many. Um, in the UK, we've probably got around 21, although every time I say the number, another press pops up and I have to redo the slides, but it's around that number, but we know we've got some bubbling under. Um, this is also a growing movement. Um, in 2018, IFLA um, started up a special interest group on library publishing. Um, that held its first meeting in, uh, in Dublin a few weeks ago. Um, at that meeting, uh, the um, Irish libraries that were there uh, were very behind um, library publishing, both for journals and monographs. And in fact, in that meeting, the Irish Library Association also announced that it was starting up a working group on library publishing to support that in, in Ireland. So we know things are moving quite, quite quickly. Um, but we've, we've still got some issues. Um, some of the things that came back from that survey, um, which is, you know, is now a couple of years old, um, were comments both from uh, the library presses but also from the academic-led presses around the lack of infrastructure, uh, the lack of a way in to the library system. Um, and this is where I want to separate um, discovery from supply chain. They're, they're, they're different. Um, the reason why we're talking about the supply chain here is um, we've got evidence going right back through the OAPEN UK reports um, up until um, last year. The, uh, one of the UUK 
uh, meetings for learned societies around the um, OA monographs mandate. Um, all the way through that, we have mostly humanities scholars saying that they inhabit a print world. They prefer, prefer print. Um, so what we're saying is we have, to, we, we have to be in those supply chains if they're in that print world. So discovery is one thing, but as we've said, that people are coming into the library, they're reading physical stuff. We're, we're talking about the, the supply chain here. So based on those comments, and, and one of the key ones was actually from, um, from Rupert Gatti at um, uh, Open Book Publishers at University of Cambridge, um, we came up with a sort of hypothesis question for a workshop that uh, Joanna's already mentioned. Um, and that is that OA publishers have difficulty accessing the channels that library acquisitions departments use to buy print and ebook content. And this was echoed by, um, by library publishers as well. Um, in that particular meeting, we actually, I think I'm fairly safe in saying, certainly in the UK, it was pretty much the first time we had um, OA monograph publishers, uh, librarians, library suppliers, metadata people, OA experts in the room. And that was quite interesting because it quickly became apparent that nobody quite understood what everybody else did. Um, one of the things the library suppliers didn't understand is why on earth you would want to create a book that you didn't sell. Um, that took about 10 minutes to, uh, to, to explain. Um, but equally, why would a library supplier want to offer a book that they weren't going to make any money out of? Um, which, was, which was another a way of, of looking at it. And actually from that, comes the idea of potential services rather than um, other things. Um, but basically, from that, we came up with four key, key themes. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through um, what those four key, uh, key themes were. Um, but also just to say that this is not just the view of that particular workshop. Um, around the same time, um, scholar-led, which is a group of six um, academic-led publishers, um, were coming up with similar things. Um, now, some of those publishers are outside of the UK. They all serve academics in the UK, and two of them, Mattering Press at Lancaster and Open Book Publishers at Cambridge, um, are, are pretty much represented in this, in this room by the libraries as, as well. Um, so, just very quickly, we, we, we realised that we probably needed to map the library supply chain to an extent that everybody understood it. Um, and that was where we potentially thought, well, this is where we need to relook at, um, uh, at, at this area. Um, and also discovery as well. Um, metadata came up. I'm going to just seamlessly pass um, through, through metadata. We could be here all, all day. Um, but essentially with this is we said, well, any, anything around metadata has to enable the acquisitions departments to actually see the open content because at the moment they can't see it. Um, they can see the stuff to purchase, they can't see that it's necessarily free. And I should say that Joanna came up with some fantastic um, screenshots of uh, publishers who had open content. Could you find the open content anywhere? No. Um, new content as well. We're, we're very much at the moment talking in, in a sort of print under glass world. Um, which is almost suppressing new forms of, uh, of, of content. So we thought that's another way to surface it and to get to the point very quickly. Um, another one, and I think it was unexpected really, came up around the need for cultural change um, in, in this process. Um, and, and one of those was, was, to, um, was for the departments to, to, to realise zero cost and to actually see zero cost and be, be supplied with... Um, with zero cost. At that point, I'll hand back to, uh, to Joanna. Okay, thanks, Graham. So, Graham's illustrated one very practical area where action um, is required to enable us to deal with open content. Um, but this illustrates a much wider point in that libraries, like publishers, need to prepare themselves for um, an open access world. <laughs> If we were to redesign our libraries around the, the idea that most of our content was open, what would that actually look like and how would we get there? Um, these are some strategic measures that, that we feel um, would be steps in, in the right direction. Um, 
we feel that libraries need to develop um, or rethink <coughs> our collection strategies and policies. So aggress addressing the the acquisition or at least the management of open content as a whole. So just as we've moved from a, kind of a print world to a digital world, um, or at least print only to, to digital first, maybe we need to be moving to an open first policy. Um, we need to provide a framework to enable decision making around open content initiatives. For example, if you have um, a very limited budget, how do you make the decision whether to pledge some money towards um, Knowledge Unlatched or towards the Open Library of the Humanities. At the moment, we just don't have, or certainly within, within my library, we don't have the, um, the measures to be able to work out w which of those is of better value for us. And we need to redefine how we measure the value of library content. So moving away from the idea that content only has a value if money is changed hands. We're still... Um, obsessed with cost per download, cost per usage um, within the library world. What alternative metrics are there when most of your content is open? We can also commit to library investment in open content and content infrastructure. Many of us at the moment are having strategic um, discussions with senior leaders within our institutions about the need to move from a kind of pay to read to a pay to publish world and this this is these are challenging enough decisions uh, discussions as it is but now we're, we're saying that we need to go back to to our leaders and say we need to be giving money to um to towards in, um, infrastructure that we're not necessarily going to see any direct return on investment for there's progr a program of cultural change required within our team so encouraging teams to see open as a shared responsibility not something that's just a concern of the research support team. And that involves bringing the management of open content into job descriptions um, across the library, bringing um, open down from our high-level strategies and making sure it's reflected in our operational plans. And there's also opportunities, I think, for us to work together at sectoral level. So, for example, um, Graham and uh, Sarah Thompson from the University of, Law of York will be um, leading a workshop at um, NAG, which is coming up very soon, on this issue of the open access monograph book supply with practitioners. So far, we've focused on research material, but for teaching, there's also a role for our academic engagement teams to encourage the selection, evaluation of, and use of open educational resources and open textbooks within their teaching. And we need to develop a clear understanding of the costs and benefits of delivering open content and services to inform decision making around future investment. Just being open doesn't mean it's free. And actually, even being able to quantify the, uh, the activity that you're putting, or the energy that you're putting into open content is really challenging. And very finally, Masood. Um, we need to redefine um, what a successful library looks like. And there's been lots of discussions here at this conference about going back to uh, the very basics about what a library is for. Just as we don't measure a library's success by the number of books in our collections anymore, we need to find new measures fit for purpose in an open content world. So not benchmarking ourselves by the size of our content budget or our expenditure for um, FTE students, the challenge for us is to find new measures that relate to the impact that we have on our communities. Thank you very much for listening. We're aware that this is going to be, it's, it's not something, we've just presented you with a lot of questions, not necessarily any answers, and that actually it's a sexual approach to this is going to be um, required. So we are um, be really interested to have your input on how to take this forward. Thank you. <laughs>